Okay, so we are in lockdown, as everybody knows at this stage, there is no live sport. Uh, that said, we want to take a jaunt down memory lane, and we're looking forward to doing this. We have Richard Cooper. Richard, I'm, I'm told this came about really in that our tireless producer, JP, was talking to you. You obviously have done various bits on the show. Some good, some bad, I might add, but uh, you've done various yeah. bits on the show. Yeah, some guy I was doing with loads of hair and glasses. Yeah, <laughs> it didn't work. It didn't work for me. And you mentioned to JP that you were, I didn't know this about you, you were, you were and I suppose are, an avid uh, snooker fan. So we thought, well, let's have a chat about your relationship with snooker. And we have drafted in some snooker royalty as well. So hello to you and hello to world champion. Thank you very much. Ken Doherty. How are you doing, Ken? Joe, very good. Thank you. Hi, Richard. How are you? How are you, Ken? A yeah, pleasure to be in the same chat as you can. <laughs> uh, we, were only, we only just met. Only, uh, must have been only a week ago, was it? When we were walking the dogs together down in the yeah. park and we were having a little... Funny enough, we were having a little chat about uh, snooker memories as well, weren't we? And, uh, That's right, because the Crucible would have been on yeah, at that yeah, time. Yeah. And I'm, I remember saying that to you, you must feel a bit lost. Yeah. It would have been on. And uh, we were talking about the matches that the BBC were showing. They were showing two hours of editors' highlights, weren't they? Of classic matches. Yeah. Mm. I think you were involved maybe in a couple uh, that they showed. Yeah. And, uh, but I was saying, actually, I was wondering, I was asking you why they didn't have... Higgins and White semi final in nineteen semi final. I know, yeah, yeah. It was one of the one of the classics, wasn't it? You know, and particularly, yeah, and particularly that break in the penultimate frame. You know, to level at fifteen, all oh, back against the wall. Higgins sixty nine break from when he was fifty five or six behind, like one of the yeah. best breaks ever at the World Championship. And, and he uh, kept on running. Yeah, very, position, didn't very he? surprised he didn't. Uh, very surprised that they didn't show that that particular match. Yeah, yeah, but it was. I was. I mean, I was as well probably just as amazed or as kind of enthused about the commentary yeah. at the time. <laughs> and uh, the Jack Carnham and uh, I think he was a coach, wasn't he? And more he was a coach, yeah, 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 he was, yeah. And John Spencer, who had won it in the 70s a good few times, I think. Mm. But I remember John Spencer saying it was a brilliant comment actually live. And I yeah. think it was pretty spontaneous as Higgins was lining up yet another like impossible shot and it was a blue in the middle of the table and he had yeah. to screw back off the side cushion you know to come back for the reds and it was a mad like attempt yeah 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 but of course uh, john spencer says i'm nervous for him jack <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think i think if he completes this it will be the greatest break of the two <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely so it was just lovely little moments like that and yeah 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 um, but uh, but win it, win it, he did, and it really was. It was like your heart. Yeah, it was incredible. It was incredible. Yeah, I mean that uh, that year for me, that was the year sort of uh, I got really hooked on snooker. You know, when Higgins won that in '82, and then of course Dennis Taylor won it in '85. You know, but uh, you know, you go back to commentary, and we were talking uh, Joe only in the park, and we were talking about the great Ted Lowe. It was one of our uh, greatest commentators. You know, and they used to call him Whispering Ted Lowe as well. And I never knew why they call him Whispering Ted Lowe, but apparently he used to initially commentate for the radio and he'd have to sit right up close to the table. So that's where he got the whispers from, you know, uh, when, it, when he was commentating live on the radio before even TV started uh, showing like live pictures of snooker. And, uh, but he was, for those of you watching in black and white, the brown is next to the blue. <laughs> yeah. That yeah, was one of, right. one, of the, one of the all-time classics. You know? Yeah, yeah. There's been many kind of uh, oh, many, of that many. comment since. But there was, um, there was one brilliant comment, and I, I, I watched the, um, the recent coverage between uh, was Joe Johnson, Steve Davis in 86, and Johnson. Yeah. And, um, and Joe, when he was lining up his shot, Joe Johnson, when he was lining up the shot, the eyebrows would be, you know, and it was a long, particularly if it was a long distance, like, you know, length of the table, red or whatever. Yeah, yeah. To be going like that, and Ted Lowe said, "I think he applauded that shot with his eyebrows." It's <laughs> cracking. Um, but, uh, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, uh, I remember. It was, I mean, there's so many of them, you know. And uh, uh, I remember uh, Dennis Taylor telling me one about Fred Davis when Fred Davis was playing, and he got to the semi-finals of the World Championship, Fred, when he was 65 years of age, you know. And he was one of those players uh, initially that we didn't see very often, but you could play left-handed or right-handed and if he, he was stretching over the table he couldn't reach it right-handed so he slipped his leg back down on the table onto the floor 
and then play the left-handed, you know? And Ted Lowe famously said, BBC Grandstand, well, Fred Davis, all of 65 years, finding it now hard to get the leg over, <laughs> and now prefers to use his left hand instead. <laughs> 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 live, live on BBC Grandstand, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, carry on, absolutely. carry on up the crucible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. If I we're talking about era, can I be so rude as to ask what, what, what are your respective ages? Uh, I'm fifty. Uh, Fifty-one September. Fifty-two. God. Yeah, yeah. Why aren't you aging, Ken? What's the story there, genuinely? Well, thanks a million, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. I tell you, I'm aging on the inside, Joe. I don't know about the outside. It's only on the inside, that's for okay. sure. <laughs> so you, you, you both came to this at a, obviously basically the same age. So mm. is, it, is it Higgins for you, Richard? Is that the lightning bolt moment? I think so. I think it was also, um, like, I remember watching the, 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 you know, when some person is, uh, one person is dominant in a sport like Davis was, you want somebody, I suppose, to break it up. And um, yeah. even though, like, Davis is only starting his dominance in the 80s, that 82 match um, between um, Higgins and White was, yeah, I just, just thought, like, Higgins, his, his style alone, yeah. and the fact that he didn't have to wear a dicky bow, he got special dispensation not to wear a dicky bow because it caused a rash. Like, he had, actually had a doctor search, which he has to show to the PBSA, the World Beard Snoop, Snooker Association, whatever it's called. And, um, but it was almost like, I kind of refer to this in an article, but it was almost like there was a kind of a, like he was strangulated by the dicky bow, but he was also also by the by the billiard association. Wasn't yeah, it? yeah, and, yeah, 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 you know, just, yeah. Just yeah. Leave me alone. The conformity of it, mm. um, and it was there was things that he used to do, apart from kind of walking around the table like he was one of those Olympic race walkers, and <laughs> lashing back the vodkas and tonics, and like basically sucking the filter out of the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, he was just this swashbuckling character. He'd come on wearing a a, a, a big hat. Yeah, big fedora. Um, yeah, 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 big yeah, fedora exactly. And you know, then he'd take off the dicky belt and be all. You know, twitchy, like right? Yeah. Sniffing and nervy, and um, yeah. So you have the open neck shirt, but he just—I just thought, who is this? Like he was yeah, like yeah, a yeah. movie star in the mm. middle of all this, mm. um, and then he was just pulling shots out of the bag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. You'd never seen because it was—it was a pretty <sighs> clear of the sport, Ken, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah, it was. It was pretty. Uh, it would have been. I mean, it was very sort of gentlemanly and, and very quiet, you know what I mean? But when Higgins came on the scene, he sort of, it was like opening a, a can of worms and, and it attracted, you know, so many like you and I and a lot of our generation to the game and, and would have made like snooker back in the 80s as big as it was yeah. uh, because of on his own himself, you know what I mean? Because of the character and the electricity. And he was one of those. He was one of those players, and I remember when I was when I was an usher in Goffs, and I, I met him for the first time. When he was sitting in his chair, he had an electricity. People would watch him in his chair rather than watch the other guy at the time, because yeah. he didn't know what he was going to do. He was twitching all the time, and he was just he had the electricity around him was just mm. incredible, you know, incredible. Yeah. How good was he, Ken? He was brilliant. I mean, I played him. I, I didn't play him at his best, but I played him when I turned pro. Uh, in the early ni 1990, I turned pro, but I played him, I think, uh, that year, 1990-91. And uh, he beat me, actually, in the UK Championships one year. He beat me 6-3 six, six or 6-4, six but played really well. But he was, yeah, he was really good. I saw him, I think his best years were behind him when I was a pro. But mm. uh, when he, I think when he beat Hendry uh, down in, at an, um, in Goffs when he was 5-1 down, he beat him in the final, came back to beat him 9-8. It was one of the the, the great uh, greatest finals down there, and and that was when he was on his way out. And Hendry was at the top, so he was still an excellent player, an excellent match player. Got a great, even though he was such a great potter, he had such a great safety brain as well, you know. And the thing about Higgins, you were so nervous playing him. He had that because he had that aura about him, and even when he wasn't playing at his best, he could still put you off like your own game, you know that type of way. But uh. He was, he was, one story about Dennis Taylor, he told me when he was playing Higgins, it was the time, not long after, I remember Higgins said he'd have him shot the next time he was in Belfast, and uh, Taylor was playing him in Guffs, and uh, Dennis Taylor was introduced fourth, and when you're introduced fourth, you're normally the second seed, so you're the lower seed, 
you're supposed to sit at the green side uh, of the table, you know, the green pocket. Uh, but Dennis Taylor and all the anxiety and the pressure, he went to the yellow side of the table, sat down and poured himself uh, what he thought was from a jug of ice water, you know. Uh, when, he, when he tasted the straight vodka, he knew he, he, knew he was on the wrong, on the wrong side, side of the table. Yeah. Straight vodka, yeah. That's straight vodka. Yeah, was yeah. He, was he he like, was, I think it was the whole package with, with Alex Higgs, and obviously yeah. he was known as the people's champion and all that. And I think some of it was, well, was because he, he fell apart sometimes, didn't he, as well? Yeah, 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 I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like and sometimes when the when the safety belt was too much, he just lash out. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you'd seen him kind of at both ends, where you know both ends of the spectrum, where he was just he couldn't miss, and he was unbelievable and uh, spontaneous. And then also the other side, which was just oh screw this, I can't be bothered. Well, it wasn't <laughs> yeah. even bothered. It was just yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Frustration yeah. got the better of. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, it was I, great I, character. And so, Richard, in the midst of all this, you get a little six by three, and then you start playing the game. <laughs> Yeah, like I was actually, I was saying this as well before, like I, I had this, um, we, b before I even got to 6x3, like what was the, the spur for my ma to get me a 6x3 was we had this little uh, dinner table uh, in, the, in the telly room basically and um, it had sort of soft edged um, corners, you know, there wasn't really kind of hard edged corners because I suppose we were all kids, but, um, but I was so obsessed one year uh, with the cruise, but I think it was probably that same year mm. that... I, I got a six polystyrene cups and sellotaped <laughs> them to the corner and the oh, middle brilliant. of the table. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I yeah. painted um, table tennis balls, red, white, and black, <laughs> I think it was, uh, about four or five table tennis balls, and made a cue out of, there's a bit of tubing uh, uh, that my dad had for something or other, and put a, 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 a pawn, a snooker piece from a pawn, uh, up to the felt end out. And oh, yeah. that was my, that was my, yeah, stick. yeah, yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. So I think when, uh, I think when Ma saw that, she said, okay, right, either he is a problem uh, <laughs> uh, or, or something, but so either way, I think we need to get him the snooker table. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah. The best, it was the best present. I couldn't actually believe that that was a uh, six point three. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, you know, well, I, rem I remember, I remember when I saw Higgins, the first time I saw Higgins was actually in Pop Black, and I think it was only about eight or nine. So it was around 77, 78. And uh, that year, I got a small little table uh, about this size. It was at the end of my bunk bed from Santa, you know? Yeah. And we used, to, we used to put that on the dinner table. Um, and we'd have, or put it on the floor. And it'd be little, like, sort of marble balls and small little cues this side. <laughs> And uh, eventually the rubber on the rails, you know, that was supposed to be there for cushions, they eventually went, they sort of withered away, you know. So once yeah. you hit the rail, the ball would just fly down the rail and into the pocket, you know. <laughs> It'd stick to it like glue. Yeah. Uh, but then uh, a few years later, when I think it was about 11, I got a, a six by three and we used to sometimes erect it in the, in the living room. And then when the sun came out, we'd have it up in the back garden. And they were my memories... Uh, uh, from my father because my father would watch it he was a big Ray Raiden fan so I, I'd, I'd watch it with him and uh, and then he'd watch me play out in, on the little six by three out in the garden or in the front room sometimes you know? how, how quickly did you sort of <clears throat> improve kind of like, I mean like when did you make your do you remember like geez I just made a 50 break there or yeah I think I was I, well I think that year I was about 13 when I made my first 50 and then I was 14 when I made my first century you know so uh, was that on the six by three or, or the full size oh no no in, in Jason's on the full size okay yeah okay. yeah 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 so and I won my first uh, my first tournament my first national tournament was in September 1983 and it was the Irish under 16 championship. And uh, I ended up winning that out in um, um, Noel Diamond's place, out in Finglas, in the Classic in Finglas. The Classic? Uh, the Classic in Finglas. And it's still there, believe it or not. It's one of the few snooker clubs that's still actually open. But in 1983, that was my very first tournament, uh, national tournament, uh, boys under 16. And, and I won it. And I, was, I still have the trophy today. My mother <laughs> kept that trophy. Uh, and we dug it out. It's down in the Radisson now, in, in the snooker room, you know. So was that what made you kind of think, okay, mm. I, I'm going to do this now for a living? Uh, well, I just, I just, I just that kept playing. I mean, I just loved it, you know. Loved yeah. watching it. Uh, loved playing it. I kept playing football right up until I was about 16, and thought, 
I know I can earn some money at snooker. I'm not going to earn any money at football because we used to have little handicap snooker handicap tournaments on every Saturday in, in Jason's. And uh, more often than not, I'd pick up the winners uh, checking that. You know, five are in. You know, there might be about 20 runners and there might be 30 or 40 pounds for the winner. You know, and that was great pocket money those days. Yeah. Uh, and it was much better than going out to Bushy Park and the lashings around during the winter time, you know. So uh, that was the end of the football career. And then I just said, I was just going to stick to the snow career, you know. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, Joe, I, I'm doing your job here. But sorry. But... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I want to I I pick both your brains here, you know. So yeah. if you mention 1983, Ken, that's why yeah. Steve Davies uh, wins that year. He beats Cliff Thorburn. Yeah. Thorburn and goes on to, to dominate, obviously. Richard, were you looking at Steve Davis full of admiration as well? Or was he a Marmite figure? Or was, was he ruining the sport by winning every year? What, what, was, what was the Davis situation for you? Well, it was kind of begrudging kind of respect. Mm -hmm. um, like, it, it did seem at one stage that he couldn't miss. I mean, I think particularly uh, he won the first in 81. And then um, he was beat, wasn't he, very early in 82? Yeah, Tony Knowles. Tony Knowles, but yeah. Tony Knowles beat him 10 1 or something. I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, but then he won it again in 83 and 84. I, yeah, I, I kind of felt uh, th the one thing I always think that, that um, I'd give uh, Davis sort of credit for was that he was responsible for some of the best matches in, the, in sport, wasn't he? Because yeah. he was so brilliant and it was such an incredible achievement to beat him. Um, and when Davis beat him, or sorry, when, when Taylor beat him in that final, it was just like that really made the sport, didn't it? Mm. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. And, 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 the, and the fact that they had, like Davis and Higgins had this great rivalry between each other, you know, the good yeah. and the bad, like, you know. And, uh, and were you a Higgins a, man or a Davis man? Uh, I was always a Higgins man, yeah, you know. Okay. And I always say that to Steve, you know what I mean? He wouldn't. I remember what, there was one quote from Higgins, you know, and a reporter said to Higgins, uh, would you would you not you know go out with Davis like see Steve Davis socially and Higgins turn around? I'd rather have a drink with Edie. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> more, more of a chance of it as well, probably. Yeah, yeah. But uh, no, I mean, but Davis actually, even though he, he he never got on with Higgins, they they were sort of chalk and cheese. But I think as he grew as he grew older, he had more of a respect for him and, and sort of. Uh, I mean, I remember him doing the documentary there on the BBC and uh, some of the matches, and Higgins was one of them. And he, he started crying. He started filling up because he was interviewing Higgins' daughter. Uh, and he started filling up. He said he misses, he, missed, he misses Alex Higgins now, like, you know, and some of the great games. He didn't appreciate it then. But as he got a bit older, he started to appreciate it. But they started that great rivalry that everybody loved to, to see the two of them play each other. It was just fantastic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and, and also the sport, probably, even though it didn't fully embrace Higgins, um, yeah. I mean, it didn't embrace him at all, really. Uh, mm. it, it really needed him, didn't it? Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he, he drew crowds everywhere he went, you know? I mean, and when you played him, the atmosphere was like no other uh, atmosphere against any other player. And players used to love or hate playing him because of it. Uh, but yeah. I, I must say, any time I... Uh, I played him. I absolutely loved it. The only time I didn't like playing him was when I played him at the World Championship and it was the last time he ever played there and I beat him 10, I think it was 10-6. We played the very first round of the Crucible. Oh, and, what year was uh, that? Then? I think it was 1994. Yeah. And he, ne he, never played, he never played another match. And during the match, he had a big flare-up with, uh, with John Williams, the referee, which I knew was going to happen at some stage because John Williams was quite a forthright, very strong referee, you know? And Higgins uh, was at the table. Now, he, I think I was about 8-4 up at one stage. And uh, then he started to implode a little bit. And uh, he, he said to John Williams, John Williams was standing on his right-hand side. And he, he just went like that, as if to say, get over. Did it to my left-hand side. And John Williams says, no, Alex, I've been staying here all day. You can't see me. I'm not in your line of sight. He goes, you're not in my line of sight, John. You're in my line of thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, it's just anything, anything yeah. to spark around, you know. But he was uh, fantastic. But that was the last. That was the only match I think I never really enjoyed playing uh, to beat him, and it was his last appearance. And uh, but he was good as gold to me. You know, we were we were good. We became really sort of good friends in a way after that. You know, which was quite nice. You know. Yeah. Mm. Is, Ta is Taylor's win in '85? Is that the high point, Richard? 
I think it probably was. Um, I, I'd certainly, for, you know, obviously having not played us to any great level, that was, that was to me, just from a television perspective, uh, the pinnacle. And um, it seemed like from then on, I thought, like, I, I loved watching Ken play. I loved watching Ken winning it, obviously, as well, in 97. But I thought, I thought the Hendry era wasn't as exciting, you know, yeah, I, yeah. maybe because he was just so dominant. <clears throat> even though Davis had been dominant in the 80s, um, I just thought there was more drama, more excitement. And I know it's a bit of a cliche to say there were more characters because it's a bit of a rose tinted yeah, yeah. kind of a... Yeah, uh, perception, but I, I do think there's a bit of truth in that as well. Um, that that Henry was almost like too good, and even though you beat him that year in '97, Ken, yeah, that must have been. I mean, for you going into that, that must have been. Did you feel like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna? No, not at all. I mean, I, I had a, I had a terrible run up to that year, and my, I, I was only, uh, I had to win my first round match to stay in the top sixteen. So that was like. That was the huge match for me, and uh, because you know I, the run up to it, I'd lost in three first rounds: two to Davis, Steve Davis, and then one to Michael George, fellow countryman in the British Open. So I had a terrible run in; I wasn't playing that well. And uh, I remember in the run, the, the couple of weeks before practicing in Ilford and Essex, I played. Well, Sullivan and I never really practiced that much with each other, but we said, "Look, at, we sort of." put our little differences aside and we said, look, let's practice together every day for the, for the couple of weeks before the World Championship. And we got into a sort of a, a mode playing each other, like best, two best of 19 sometimes each day or one best of 19, whatever the case may have been. And uh, we, went, we both went to the World Championship. He was absolutely flying and he made that 147 that year in five minutes and 20 seconds. Yeah. Uh, and I, my, my main concern was winning that first match against Mark Davis to stay in the top 16. And once I did that, it was sort of like a weight lifted off me, and I start and I play, beat Steve Davis in the next round. Uh, I beat him thirteen three, and then I beat Higgins in the quarterfinals. Uh, Robbie Dill, and going into the final, I thought I had a chance against Henry, but he was going for like six in a row, uh, like thirty yeah. matches in a row, which was quite. So I was a big underdog, but um, what kept me going uh, was the images of Higgins and Taylor lifting the cup. You know those images where they're lifting the, the cup up and they're lifting it up to the crowd and the spotted lights in the ceiling and stuff like that. And I could see myself doing that for some reason. I used to dream about it like during that World Championship and I could visually see myself lifting the cup. This was before the final or anything. And that sort of kept me very relaxed. And it sort of it was like, you know, you know the power is, people talk about the power of visualization. That's what it was like for me. I could see myself lifting the cup. And it sort of calmed me. You know, I wasn't as nervous as I probably should have been against Stephen Hendry going into that final. And uh, I just played as, as well as I've ever played and uh, couldn't have played, played much better. And beaten like 80 and 12 in the end, which was quite uh, uh, a marginal victory, you know. That's amazing. Did you have that mm. type of visualization in future tournaments? <laughs> Sometimes they used to come and go, but you know what they always say if you could bottle that, you know, yeah. you, you, you know. Most people, most sports people would say to you, you know, that they they've seen it, you know, they they've seen it before it actually happened. Uh, and for me, um, yeah, I definitely did, you know. But I w I wish I could have done it a lot more times over the years. I know that, <laughs> you know, when the yell gremlins get into your head, <laughs> you can't tissue. see anything. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah see, see, for me, I have such a different perspective and all that because I was in uh, first year secondary mm. school when you won in '97. So I hadn't, I hadn't seen the ages. Yeah, 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 yeah. And for me, and I, I, I just seemed to be this boring sort, hands up. Like yeah. the Michael Schumachers, <clears throat> uh, the, the Roger Fetters, whoever's dominant, I like seeing history <laughs> unfold. So yeah, 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 I loved yeah. Stephen Hendry. I loved yeah. watching him beat Jimmy White. I'm the only yeah. kid in class who loved watching yeah, Stephen yeah, Hendry yeah, beat yeah, Jimmy yeah, White. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but geez, yeah. when you beat him, it's hard to overstate just how awesome he was. He was going for six in a row, I think, that year. Six in a row, yeah, thirty matches in a row, which was, uh, which was quite incredible, you know. And, he and won I mean, most of his finals pretty easily, can kind of, didn't he? Like, he yeah, won. he did. I mean, the closest one apart was from uh, White. apart from White, eighty and seventeen, yeah. When when Jimmy had that black, uh, but the rest of them were were very, you know, uh, convincing wins. Like he was such a great player, Henry. Uh, he sort of he revolutionised the sport completely, you know, when he came on the scene compared to the way the game was played in the eighties. Uh, he was more, and what he sort of, 
he would have been a huge inspiration for the likes of O'Sullivan, the likes of Higgins, uh, and the likes of uh, Mark Williams in those days. And he would have inspired even the guys that are at the top of the game now, the likes of the Judd Trumps, the likes of uh, the Neil Robertson. They would have watched Hendry over the years, even though they were quite young. But they would have played the likes of him and and the way sort of Ronnie O'Sullivan brought it on again uh, to another level. You know? Sorry to interrupt, Ken. In what what aspect of the game did he change? How was it different to the eighties? He was he was a uh, well, Hendry Hendry's um, philosophy was that he was when he was at the table he was going to try and win the frame from one position. You know, he didn't want his opponent back at the table, so it was all out attack. You know, put a long red, split the pack and score and make enough to win the frame and sit down and get the next frame on the board. Where the 80s was a little bit more of a cautious type style. You, you, the way even they broke the balls, they'd go into the side of the pack and they'd take one or two reds out at a time. Whereas Hendry came with the philosophy, get on the blue, hit the, hit the pink full ball, open the, as many balls as possible and make, it, make the break as easy as possible for yourself. So that's exactly how he became such a prolific break builder. Right. That's, mm. that, see, that's snooker as I know it. I, yeah, 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 like, yeah. Of course you go into the pack off the blue. That's just what you yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's because you're used to seeing it yeah. now. But okay. when, you watch, uh, when you watch the guys back in the 80s, uh, you would see, like, uh, they'd be knocking reds off blacks, but off the corner of the pack, you know, bringing one or two out, and then they get on the black and then do it on the other side and bring one or two, and that's how they develop reds. Yeah, Whereas, more like, uh, more, more, yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. And if they got a 40 or 50 break, you know, they'd put a red safe, put a yellow safe or color safe, and then they'd try and win it on their second visit. Whereas Hendry was a one visit. He was a one visit man, like, you know. His positional play as well was, yeah, yeah. Um, was a joy to behold in fairness. Mm. But were, you, were you sitting there, Richard, with your arms crossed saying, I'm not enjoying this as much as I used to? <laughs> <laughs> I probably was, yeah. I probably yeah. was. Uh, 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 you know, just... See, but I, 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 I've kind of felt that way about like other sports as well, of like Sampras, when Sampras was dominant, I actually thought Sampras was a really boring player though, really boring tennis player. Um, particularly Wimbledon, you know, uh, it's just big serve and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Serve volley, that's it. Yeah. Uh, he was absolutely dominant as well. So I think uh, apart from Borg, um, who you know who I'm talking about, Joe, even if you didn't witness him, you know, <laughs> don't rub it in whenever you do. Um, <laughs> Uh, like I, I was always up for him. Like I was always up yeah, for him, yeah. like McEnroe and and Connors and the Stads, you know all those. But but no, I've I've, I've usually wanted whoever's dominant. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, would you not, would you have you know, Richard? Would you not have been uh, like of the Jimmy White ilk? You would not want Jimmy to win against Hendry most of the time. I, absolutely, I wanted yeah, Jimmy yeah, yeah. to win because it, it's because also I mean you know that semi final that he lost to to Higgins in eighty two. Yeah. Arguably, would have been, you know, possibly his best chance to win the thing. And if he had won that, God knows. Yeah. Yeah, my yeah, my yeah, memory yeah. of that as well was that he had a perm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He had a perm and the and the teeth. He hadn't he hadn't been to the no. Dentist, obviously. No, no, no. The, teeth, no. the buck teeth were way out, and he was kind of emotion free as well. There was no real nothing seemed to register on his face. It was just no, yeah, yeah. You no, know, yeah, yeah. uh, he was, um, you know, he just took it on the chin and and yeah. Uh, he always says, you know, Jimmy White will any time. He's no regrets around like that. And I said, like, you know, you, you think about that 82 semi-final. If you had won that, you would have won the World Championship. He says, yeah, mate. He says, I would have won the World Championship if I had B. Higgins. But I'd probably be dead by now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. What, what about as we moved into 21st century then? Did it recapture your heart, Richard? Um, well, a little bit. I, 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 you, you have to, you know, take your hat off to Ronnie, and uh, he's uh, he's he's an amazing player. And yeah, that one four seven that Ken is talking about, like, I, I suppose he is a bit of everything, hasn't he? He's a bit of, you know, uh, he's his safety play is also brilliant. Yeah. He has that magic. He's like his his one four seven was like. You know, like somebody popping balls with a wand. It was yeah, just yeah, yeah. incredible what he's able to do. Mm. Uh, but he's also has the ability to fly off the handle. Mm. Um, and you think, like, just when he's when he's acting normally, when he's kind of doesn't seem to be registering, you know, he's he's sort of yeah, I'm, everything's fine, everything actually <laughs> fine. Be sure he's gonna actually explode. Or, <laughs> I mean, it's as close as it ever came to an actual 
you know, fisticuffs in the crucible, to my knowledge, anyway, was mm. myself and Ali Carter. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Ali Carter wouldn't get out of his way. Or I, I can't even remember what happened, but it was like, that was the biggest news in, yeah. of, of the crucible. Yeah, they gave each other a little shoulder charge, didn't they, when they walked <laughs> by each other? It was quite yeah. funny, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, it has, I think it has got, um, I think it has got a bit more, um, more interesting again. Um, it, it's obviously it's not going to ever do it for me in the same way as, as, mm. as the eighties, but Trump coming along is good. Donald, not Donald Trump, Judd Trump coming <laughs> along. Um, uh, he's come along at a pretty good time as well, yeah, hasn't he? And yeah. he? He's kind of stepped it up a gear, hasn't he? Yeah, he has. Yeah. I, I love the way he plays. He's, I mean, about, he's, he's, brought he's a, really improved again. I think he's brought a, uh, a wonderful freshness to the game, you know, and he's, he, um, he sort of, um, there's some of the, his range of shots are like the Jimmy White of, of yesteryear. You know, he expresses himself. And, and even though he's not, you know, uh, facially sort of interacted with the crowd, or you, you don't get much emotion out of him, but uh, his array of shots and, and uh, talent is just incredible to watch. So he's brought a, a new sort of freshness to the game completely. So it's, it's good. Yeah. So if you go kind of... Joe Davis with his 15 titles and, and his mm. Fred. And there, so the, of the modern era, there's Henry with seven, Steve Davis six, Ronnie yeah. with five. You know, in, in golf, there's this like bit of verbal gymnastics where they say, who's the greatest? And mm -hmm. increasingly what everyone says now when they're asked is, well, Jack Nicholas with his 18 majors is the greatest champion, but Tiger Woods has played the greatest golf we've ever seen. Mm. I wonder, is there a similar thread in there with snooker, or is, is there a, is there I an think acknowledgement so. oh, Ronnie no, no. is the best? No, I think I mean Henry uh, for me the world with the world championship because he dominated for so long uh, with seven and uh, seven and ten years. I think he, he yeah. won. I mean his last his last win was in '99 when he was uh, he was only 31 years of age. I think you know so. Um, what are you being toward the, uh, I'm trying to think. Yeah, he was, he won it in 99. He was January, January 69 when he was born. So he's only 31 in six months uh, when he won his last world title, which is very, very young considering, you know, Sullivan's still going now when he's in his, his, his mid forties. Um, but I think it's very hard to compare, but I, I would say, you know, Sullivan has probably played the best snooker that we've ever seen. There's no doubt about that. I don't think anybody, uh, but Henry in a matchup to O'Sullivan in the world championship, I don't know. I think it's a pretty even match. Yeah, it's probably like the difference between match snooker and talent, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like you'd probably say O'Sullivan is the most talented player. Certainly he's the most talented player I've ever seen, but <clears throat> Henry's probably just better at winning matches. <clears throat> yeah. It'd be well, like you... It'd be like you and me playing snooker, Richard. You'd have all the talent, but I'd be the match player. <laughs> yeah, I'd be, I'd, I'd be using everything I can to put you off. <laughs> the only talent I'd have in that snooker. What happened, what happened to Henry, Ken? Um, he, he, he's just retired. He retired very young. Uh, apparently, I didn't know this at the time, but apparently he started to get a bit of the yips. And uh, he retired, I think, in 06... Um, but he, he sort of I think he had enough he, he was uh, he got a contract uh, to promote Chinese pool in China and to go over there for a week uh, every month and he thought well this is a good way out I'll take that and it's now a good time to get out of snooker because he got the yips and when you get the yips Joe at, at any sport it's, it's one of the most horrible things that can happen to any sportsman so it was probably a good time for him to get out did you ever get them? No, um, Jesus, I hope I, I never do. Don't, even, yeah, don't yeah, even say yeah. the word. No, no, I get them at golf now and again, or, <laughs> or I might get them at tennis playing Richard, but uh, uh, I haven't got yeah. them at, at snooker just yet, you know. I, I presume, I'm, I'm, I don't really know what the yips are, other than, uh, I mean, I can imagine, I can imagine <laughs> what they are. But I presume, I mean, I've heard about them in darts where you can't. Yeah, it's them exactly the, the same, exactly the same. So, so when you're on your, on your back swing, so now when you're on your back swing, yeah, yeah, you start it, you, you start jabbing, you know, instead of just playing like that. So you start, you, you don't know when to hit it, like you know. So it's, it must right. be a horrible feeling, you know. In golf, they describe it as like an electric shock. Yeah. On your, at the moment, you're meant to go from backswing to yeah, through. yeah, absolutely, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh no, it's hor it's a horrible, it's a horrible. Take up something like, else, you know? wouldn't you? 
<laughs> yeah. it's for a living. We got back to the uh, polystyrene cups at the end of the day. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah, it was a good thing there. <laughs> so yeah, you you, I mean, you both uh, had your little six by threes, and both would have started playing around the same time. I'm curious to see when your paths diverged. Richard, what was your highest break? Uh, Eighty three was my highest break. Oh, very that's, good. That's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that was on a full size. But that's that's it's funny because um, that was when I was a good bit older. And um, like I was in my twenties, I'd say, mm. maybe about twenty, and um, yeah, I would have been twenty. And it was uh, it was actually against a theatre director, and um, he's actually never given me a job since. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, I beat the lard out of him. Yeah. I, was, I was just I was just playing really well. I don't know why, yeah. and yeah. I hadn't played for a while. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I just made a I made a break of it mainly around the blue, and actually I should have got a century, but mm-hmm. uh, I'm not sure I got the yips or. Yeah. Uh, I got, <laughs> and do you ever uh, get a chance uh, to? Do you ever get a chance to play now at all on your travels or anything? Every like now and again, I played in your place a couple of times. Thanks have you for the plug there, Ken? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. No, I have. I have. I've. I've. Uh, but that was. I would have played. Um, a couple of times and not not very often but yeah, in the yeah. winter like it's it's a bit of a winter sport isn't it yeah of course it is yeah 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 i have yeah. the world championships in end, end of july is that right sir the, this year yeah we'll have the world championships the end of july they have that window where the olympics were supposed to be so uh if it goes ahead fingers crossed like you know i don't know what's going to happen between now and then uh, but hopefully it will still go ahead. Whether it'll have a crowd or whether it'll be behind closed doors, we don't know. But uh, but hopefully it will still go ahead. But you're right. Yeah, I mean, the snooker season really sort of kicks off around September, October time, and then runs till the bank holiday in May. Yeah, I probably would have got a higher break, Joe, only for the fact that I started getting interested in acting. So instead of getting the cue out, I was getting me tight <laughs> out of the wigs and practicing <laughs> Shakespeare monologues. So that was the end of me. The end of my career right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What could have been. Ken, the last one. What's the talent like coming through? Like, what, that year when I'm watching you win, I mean, me and all my mates are down the snooker club. It's just what you did. Yeah, yeah, In your yeah, teenage yeah. years yeah. after school. Mm. Like, I've no idea. I don't have kids. If that still happens, is there a lot of talent coming through? I don't, there... I don't, I don't know, to be honest. I mean, a lot of the snooker clubs... Uh, even when you were going to the snoop clubs, a lot of those have closed down. So there's yeah. not many opportunities for young kids to uh, to go and play uh, unless their fathers are bringing them or stuff like that. You don't see a lot of sort of... And the problems are because of, of these phones that we're, we're messing around with here, you know, and, and Fortnite and computer games, uh, uh, Minecraft. A lot of people are, you know, a lot of kids are starting them too young and, and they're not like delving into sports at an earlier age. So... I fear for snooker, particularly here. I mean, across the world, it's getting bigger. In China, particularly, and around the world, it's getting a lot. And in Europe, it's getting a lot bigger. But I'd like to see a lot more here. But we do have one professional who's going to be coming on the tour next year. And he's from Cork, a guy called Aaron Hill. He's the, he's the European under-18 champion and European under-21 champion. So he's got his pro ticket to start the new season uh, in September. Okay, well, we won't put pressure on him, but there's nothing like Irish involvement to get the bandwagon up and going. Again. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, you need you need somebody keep flying the flag. You know, there's no doubt about that. Okay, mm. so listen, fellas, that was great. A nice walk down memory lane. I didn't know Richard yeah. Cooper was was bunking off school to watch <laughs> snooker back in the day. I just can't believe this. <laughs> there was, there was one day, actually, myself and a pal of mine, a fella called Fred Cronin, we were walking along and we had arranged to bunk off. And we were getting the dart out to Dunleary was the idea. Oh, yeah. And, uh, didn't know what we were going to do, really. But <laughs> um, So we found a crisp £20 note before the days of Euros. £20 note right there adjacent to the dart tracks. On, oh, happy you know, days. So I thought, this is, this is, this is a sign that we, we should be playing snooker all day. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the idea of, like, I, was, I think I was 13. So, um, the, the, like, what... What constituted a treat in those days was, and how to spend your 20 quid in the best way, was uh, playing snooker all day, and we went to McDonald's twice. That was... Uh, <laughs> them were the days. That was the days, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. You can't beat them. Well, can't McDonald's is about to reopen, so we can look forward to the queues. Very <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Richard Cooper, Ken Doherty, fellas, that was great. Thanks, Emil. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thanks,